Thank you to all the supporters of HMS Unicorn who made this online talk possible. If you would like to support the work of HMS Unicorn, then please head to www.hmsunicorn.org.uk and donate. Waiting in the Wings Letters of a Pilot in World War II Guest Speaker Dr Gay Mannering Dr Gay Mannering tells the story of her father as a pilot in the Second World War. After learning to fly different planes in Canada, the USA and South Africa, he was stationed at Montrose to train as a flying instructor. He was stationed on 26 bases and five troop ships and wrote hundreds of letters home to his sweetheart, who became his wife, between 1940 and 1946. Waiting in the Wings draws on her father's letters, which tell of all aspects of the war, from his experiences learning to fly to the death of his comrades. This is really my father's story, um, as told by the letters he wrote during the war to the person he loved. And it's about his experiences as a pilot and learning to fly. It's also about his courtship of the person he eventually married, who was my mother. I'm going to explain what happened to him during each stage of the war. I'm going to read some of the letters from that time, and I'm going to show you some of the photographs um, which he took at the time as well. It's not a traumatic story, um, but it is a human story and an authentic story, and I hope that you will find it interesting and that perhaps some of the ideas that he mentions will resonate with you. So this was my father, um, Len Mannering. During the war, he was in the Air Force and he was in four countries, five troop ships, over 30 different bases, and he flew eight different types of plane. This is um, a museum exhibit set up in Montrose. Um, after he died at the age of 95, I found in his attic um, his log books and his photographs and I took them to Montrose and they set up this exhibit because his stories was was quite interesting and it had a human side to it and this is what they set up and then uh, a year later deeper in the attic in Sussex where he had retired I found a whole pile of letters over 400 letters um, that he had written to the person who became my mum and um, you can see here letters and also air graphs, which were smaller. Um, but they got there quicker because they travelled by air rather than by boat. When I read the letters, it was a very personal experience, but I realised that there was a wider story here and that there was a lot of social interest, a lot of history about the time. And I realised that perhaps there was a, a book in it. And so I decided that I wanted to share it with, with a wider group. So this is Len and Joan in 1940, in Margate, in Kent, just about 20 miles from, from France across, across the English Channel. They lived in the same street, so they knew each other, they'd known each other for years, and Len was very much in love with Joan, but it was very one-sided at that stage. She just wanted to be friends. So at this point, I'm going to read the first of the the letters. Um, so he is in Margate, he's in working in the library doing his librarianship exams, he's also in the Home Guard, and she has gone to Bromley to train as a nurse. This is a letter from Margate from my dad, 21st of February 1940. My dear Joan, I love you so much that I want to be near you every minute. My dear, please let me be more than a friend. You can't think how much you mean to me. I need you mentally. You act as a stimulant. Desire you physically? Well, I don't know about that yet, but I should love to be able to hold you in my arms. You ask me what I saw in you. Well, firstly, I see a clean, upright, truthful young woman. I admire your character, your independence. I like the way you smile, your little hands. I love the many expressions and mannerisms you have. For months now I have told you I love you, but you always refuse to believe it. God bless. Good night, Leonard. She refused to be more than a friend for about another 18 months, and eventually he realised that he just had to accept that. So this is the 15th of December 1940. Um, 
Dear Joan, things are happening down here. Last Tuesday, Hitler planted two bombs in the field at the back of our house, luckily causing no damage except to the field. On Friday night, Hitler gave us another early Christmas present in the shape of a landmine. We were roused from our sleep at night by the wardens and warned to leave our homes. The mine did not explode, the Navy having dismantled it. Your family are all well. Harry wasn't able to pinch anything when he went back because Jack hid his hair oil and your mother locked up her matches and blacking. Sunday is the day we have to stand by for 24 hours, ready for action stations. Things are warming up because of the invasion scare. We have to be constantly alert now. Yours, Len. This is my dad in his Home Guard uniform. I'd never realised he was in the Home Guard, and when I found memorabilia from the Home Guard, I assumed it was my grandfather's. And this is my dad and my mum's brother digging an air raid shelter in the back garden. This is my mum in her training to be a nurse. And these are the bomb holes in the field behind the house. And they don't look very big, but they were enormous. Um, I used to play in them as a child and you could have buried a house in there and not, not seen it at all. So I'm going to jump now to July 1941, when Len was called up in the RAF. He went first to Cornwall to train, do initial training, then was sent to Canada, USA, and eventually came back to UK and was in various Midland bases. Joan was still in Bromley. So this is a letter from September 1941 on board a ship going to Canada. Dear Joan, we are now on board ship. We are having excellent food, though we are rather cramped. I find a hammock most comfortable. We've had beef, lamb, veal, pork and chicken since we've been here. And that's not all. We can have as much chocolate, sweets, oranges, apples and cigarettes sixpence for 20 that we like to buy. But there's little to do now to eat to do except to eat, sleep and think. We no longer have to carry gas masks with us, but of course they found another worry for us in the shape of a life jacket. All the best, Len. Still a friendly letter. 8th of October 1941, he's in Camden in South Carolina in America. I went up for the first time yesterday, and I found it surprisingly easy to handle. There is absolutely no feeling of motion while flying straight and level, and the turns and banks are quite thrilling. Still in Camden in America on the 5th of November 1941. Last week was a period of events, happy ones and tragic, laughable and serious. On Monday, one of the cadets, an American, was up solo and got lost. Eventually he was found and brought home. He had made a forced landing and got stuck in mud. On Tuesday, a British cadet turned a plane completely over on its back. On this day, another fellow flew into telephone cables and Camden was without telephones for a few hours. Wednesday was the tragedy. Two planes collided while taking off. One got clear, but the other crashed and burst into flames. The pilot, a British cadet, was badly burned and had several other injuries. He died the following day. What a terrible blow to his parents in England. His funeral was on Saturday. A full military funeral, and we were allowed to wear full RAF uniform. It was a magnificent ceremony. Now he, he rests beneath the trees and in the ground, hallowed by the fallen heroes of the civil and independence wars. On Thursday, I flew solo after 10 and a half hours. Usual times here are anything from eight to 12 hours for soloing. It's a great moment when the instructor gets out and says, it's all yours a feeling of apprehension, excitement, fear 
perhaps. This is Len in his RAF uniform and in his flying suit. And this is in America. This is the particular American rigging. And what is interesting is that at this stage, America was not officially within the war, but they were actually training the US pilots and the RAF pilots together. That's one of the things that Montrose was particularly interested in, in seeing that the photographs and them together. And here's Len in two planes on Oxford in the cockpit. And here he is in front of, of a Harvard. We now jump to when he had returned from America, he came back at Christmas Day and was in Britain for um, about another six months until June, when he was eventually sent abroad again. In that period of time from January, I suppose, to June, he met up with my mum several times. Joan by then was a WAF in Gloucestershire. And so they did meet and obviously their relationship changed because by the time he went off to South Africa for 15 months, they were clearly very much an item. So this is um, a letter on board his ship going to South Africa, the 4th of July, 1942. Joan, my dearest, clearly a different start to the letter. Joan, my dearest, I shall be glad when this voyage is over, for the food is really poor and insufficient. The potatoes are all bad, and quite a lot of other food has maggots in it, which is not very appetising. If this is what we get, how do the poor devils in Libya exist? On the first night out, almost everyone was on deck in the moonlight, singing songs of home. Keep right on to the end of the road. Bluebells of Scotland, traditional songs of the British Isles, and then some hymns which were sung softly and with meaning. It was wonderful. The moon was shining on the water, the voices echoing down the ship, and the ship steaming silently forward. The night we arrived at the first port of call, the songs were of a different nature, rather happier and brighter than the first. These included Holy City and Jerusalem, seeming to suggest and one was glad and thankful for a safe voyage. Psychology at work, eh? I've seen some flying fish, not at all what I expected, quite small in fact, resembling sparrows rather than fish. The colour of the sea changes from green to bluish green and finally to a very deep royal blue. It's impossible to compare this last colour, one has to see it to believe it. When the sun shines on the spray made by the ship, miniature and momentary rainbows are formed. At night, the stars are reflected in the dark water. It's fine, Joan, but I think I preferred the North Atlantic trip. Maybe because then I wasn't quite so far away from home. This time, I've really felt this parting because it was a new experience and I went off without a care. Now I know how much it must have hurt mum. I don't mean that I'm unhappy about it. No. It's just I realise I'm thousands of miles away. And yet, Joan, do you know I often feel you are very close. Are you watching me, perhaps? I miss you oh so much. Almost every day my last thoughts are with you and on waking my thoughts are with you again. I think of the very happy times we've had and laugh at one or two misunderstandings. Your Len. On arrival in South Africa, this is the 15th of August, 1942. Hello, darling. We are still at the same camp somewhere in South Africa. It seems we'll be here for a while as the flying schools are closed. I feel sure we will never be able to do any flying, much less fighting in the war. In which case, I'm glad, or am I happy, or am I sad, or sorry? I'm not sure. I expect when the time comes, I'll be just as eager as I was when I joined this outfit. 
Life here is very pleasant. Too easy. I fear we tend to forget the war, which now more than ever must be won. We are allowed out nearly every day from 1 p.m. till midnight, and we go to dinner at Mr. Rysdale's house. It's almost as though I were in my own home. I can have a bath any time I like, listen to the wireless, or play the piano. Hot water is unobtainable in camp. Yours with love, Len. In Pretoria, South Africa, 3rd of October, 1942. The last day out at our last station, Met and I went to lunch in town at the services club. A delightful cold meat and salad followed by fruit and ice cream. The cost of the great sum of one shilling. I hope I'm making you envious. Then we went to the cinema called Ye Olde Playhouse. If you look at the ceiling, you can see stars and clouds passing overhead. There was a special concession to the military. That's us. We got in for one and three. After cinema, we had a mixed grill of sausages, kidney, a chop, a piece of steak, chips and tomatoes, all for three and six. Still in Pretoria, 26th of December, 1942. I promised to tell you about the pests of this place. There are the usual flies, some very large beetles, about four times the size of those in England, and there are grasshoppers, very pretty colours they are too. The real terror seems to be the scorpion, and thank goodness I haven't seen many of those. There are plenty of snakes, the small ones, and lots of lizards too, and an animal called a camel lion, obviously a chameleon. It's very much like a lizard. It lives on flies and it catches with them with its tongue, which is almost as long as the animal itself. The camel lion, though usually green, changes its colour to the same as the surroundings. If you put it on something brown, the camel lion changes to brown. Put it on something white and it changes to that colour. There were very few letters from my mum to my dad but I have got a couple. This was a, an air graph from Joan in Margate on the 7th of January, 1943. My dear Len, I had two air graphs from you yesterday. Also your mum and dad had one each. In mine, you said not, you had not heard from me that I had received your parcels, but I have thanked you in several letters in case you haven't received them. I can thank you again anyway. I received both the undies and the stockings within a few days of each other. I love them. I tried them all on the night I got them, in, fright, in front of an admiring audience consisting of Mum and Gladys. I showed them to your mother and let your father have a peep at the colours. Then I packed them away till Christmas, though I did take a look now and again. They fit beautifully but they were a wee bit on the large size, but I soon rem remedied that. I wore them on Christmas Day, or some of them, for the first time. I always knew you had good taste, though I didn't think it went as far as undies. I tried to be annoyed at you for sending them, but I couldn't be. No more news. Au revoir, my love. Joan. Back to a letter from my dad on the 17th of January, 1943. Six more of our boys, my pals from the old Letitia have been killed and another badly injured in a crash. It seems tragic to think of all these boys, what they've been through, and now they are no longer here. Kimberley, South Africa, 8th of May, 1943. Did I tell you we've started flight night flying again? Believe me, it gets quite cold at night, especially in the air. So we make full use of the heaters in the aircraft. I've passed my formation flying test. The instructor who took the test was very pleased and said I was above average. I've done an instrument flying course and a cross country trip. In this, one flies entirely on instruments a shield covers everything except the instrument, so the ground cannot be seen. We then fly on three different courses, noting the time and speed, and we should arrive back at base. And in my case, 
I was just slightly to the left after an hour and a half. Kimberley, 29th of May, 1943. On Tuesday, I took up my first passenger. This was for a flight of 250 miles. It was a mild sense of a thrill, but also a sense of responsibility. I did another 25 to a 250 mile trip today, but my co-pilot was flying and I was navigator. In order to take drifts, one has to crawl down into the nose of the aircraft and use the instrument. It's easy for me to do because I'm small, but some fellows have an awful job getting down and even worse, getting back. Another aircraft from Joan, from Margate, 22nd of March, 1943. My dear Len, I'm writing this in the twilight. The last few minutes before we put up the blackout and shut away the day. I've had my final interview and I'm to be called up within six weeks. I'm going to be a wireless transmitter. I've bought a book on Morse and I need to try a little tapping out on the piano before I go. Jack has passed his driving test and we're hoping he will come on leave next week. Henry is home at the moment. I'm glad seeing them both before I go. Good night, my love. Joan. A letter from Len on board the ship coming back on September 1943 after 15 months away. We crossed the equator today so at a very rough estimate we have something like 3,500 miles before we reach England. Conditions on board do not improve. My only complaint is about the food. The following is the usual menu. Breakfast, porridge, unsweetened, not fit to eat anyway. Small pieces of bacon, which the officers don't like, and cold potatoes. One slice of bread and butter, jam if possible, and tea, which is even worse than the stuff made in South Africa. Lunch, dishwater, served up as soup, stew, one spoonful, slice of bread, Unsweetened custard and pudding without sugar, all on one plate. Supper, one or two spoonfuls of beans, one slice of bread and butter, jam if there's any left over from breakfast. Sometimes we have one slice of corned beef. My stomach aches all day from lack of food. My clothes don't fit me anymore. I'm fading away. This is Len and his friend Matt in South Africa. There's some bananas and a lot of time they were camping. He would have enjoyed that because he was always a bit of a boy scout. Another one here. And this is him getting his wings in South Africa. And this is mum, Joan, who had signed up by then and she had um, moved to Gloucestershire to train in, in the WAF. Back in Britain, 1943 onwards. Len was actually sent to the Flying Instructor School in Montrose, and then he was supposed to down to Gloucestershire, where Joan was, and they eventually got married in 1944. So here's a letter from um, Staffordshire on the 26th of December, 1943. My dearest Joan, the only reason I got up early on Christmas Day was to have my egg for breakfast. It was worth getting up for. The dinner was the best I've seen. Turkey, ham, baked potatoes, sprouts, followed by Christmas pudding and cigarettes. In the afternoon, Charles, Chris and I went for a walk. We put on our boots, rubber, knee airmen for the use of, as it was muddy, and we tramped all over the fields and through the woods. It was great. I must admit we were rather like young children, but we thoroughly enjoyed ourselves, so why worry? All my love, Len. Another letter, 31st of January 1944. Had some fun this afternoon. I climbed up in a kite, right through the clouds, flew about 200 feet above them. After a while, I noticed another aircraft a little behind on my starboard side. It turned out to be one of the boys, so we did a spot of formation flying. Then he gave the magic signal and we broke away and zoomed among the clouds and did a spot of dogfighting. Oh boy, it was good. It's ages since I've had a trip like that. 
Wish you'd been with me. Montrose, Scotland, 14th of February, 1944. My dad was not very pleased that he was being sent to Montrose to become an instructor pilot instead of being sent to a squadron. But it was by no means a safe option because there were lots of flying and lots of accidents. My dear Joan, did I tell you Montrose is right on the coast? Inland, about 30 miles, are hills and mountains with snow on them, making it very picturesque, especially when the sun is shining. We have to wear May Wests as well as parachutes because the flying is done over water. I had to interrupt this letter and do a trip. I guess I must be dead lucky because I tipped the kite right up on its nose, buried the undercarriage and part of the props in the ground and got out quite safely. This happened at our auxiliary drome. I thought I'd have stayed there all night, but one of the boys came out for me. Wish I'd had my camera with me. It was a funny sight to see the kite sticking with a tail right up in the air. I had to make a report and see the boss, but everything's okay. I'm not being charged. There was practically no evidence anyway. Montrose, 30th of March, 1944. They'd got engaged in January. Mom says the wedding dress arrived, complete with slip and veil. She says it will not need much alteration to fit you. She's put it in a suitcase, together with my curios, and takes it down the dugout whenever she has to go down. This is Len and Joan when they were both stationed at South Cerny. For about a year they were able to be at the same uh, camp. And this is them getting married in July 1944. And the wedding photograph. It must have been quite sad for my mum to have to get married without the presence of her brothers. But one of her brothers was in a prisoner of war camp in Germany and two others were abroad at the time. I was born in October 1945 and they were, were married for 58 years. So this is the, the last letter from my dad. Um, this was the 6th of June, 1946, when he was demobbed. At the time, he was in Feltwell in Norfolk. My own darling, this is probably the last letter I'll write to you before I'm demobbed. The actual day is next Tuesday, and I'll be leaving here on Thursday. We'll arrive home about 11 o'clock on Thursday night. Don't wait up. I have to return here Monday night and then go to London on Tuesday. Happy days. My logbook has been returned. I'm assessed as above average pilot navigator and bat instructor. I have to see the CO tomorrow for the final interview. And then I've got to wait to see the MO till Thursday. No more now, sweetheart. Longing to see you again. Good night, kid. Your loving Len. Four kisses and two kisses for bundle. That was me. This was Joan and Len on their 50th anniversary living in Sussex and um, they had 58 happy years together and my mum died when she was 80 and when my dad was 85 he got married again to Elizabeth. Um, here's me acting as her maid of honour and my husband Andy acting as my dad's best man and they were married very happily for another 10 years before my, my dad eventually died when he was 95. I put together the, the letters and photographs and some additional commentary into a book which has been published. And um, as Sam Finley said, the royalties go to the, the museum in Montrose. <laughs>